So there are all kinds of myths and legends about him, but what do we actually know about Sir William Wallace? And yeah, we're probably going to piss some people off with this one. Okay, William Wallace was one of the leaders during the early stages of the First War of Scottish Independence, which technically lasted from 1296 until 1328. Long story short, the King of Scotland fell off his horse and died, his heir fell ill and died, and the noble families were at the brink of civil war to decide the next king. Instead, they turned to England's King, Edward I, to determine who their new king would be, and in exchange for being proclaimed Lord Paramount of Scotland, Edward picked John Beloy, who he still treated as beneath him and saw Scotland as little more than a vassal state. Everybody got that? Sir William Wallace was born sometime around 1270 somewhere in Scotland. According to Blind Harry's 15th century poem, The Wallace, he was born in Eldersley and was the son of a Sir Malcolm. However, we have Wallace's official seal, which names his father as Alan Wallace, who was a minor noble in Ayrshire, if it's even the same Alan Wallace, and we only know of him because his name appears in the Ragman Rolls, which was a list of Scottish nobles that pledged allegiance to the King of England. England in 1296. So if that is his father, then Wallace's father didn't die when he was young. We do know that William had at least two brothers, Malcolm and John. So we know he was born sometime around 1270, and that's about all we know about him until 1297. It is believed that he may have served in Edward I's army, possibly as an archer. Also, we have no record of him marrying, and this was probably made up by Blind Harry. And what we know of him from 1297 was that he was involved in the killing of William de Hesselrig, the English High Sheriff of Lanark. Afterward, he joined with William the Hardy, Lord of Douglas, and they carried out the Raid of Scone. This was one of several rebellions taking place across Scotland at the same time, including those of several Scottish nobles and Andrew Moray in the north. In fact, if anyone doesn't really get the credit they deserve, it's Andrew Moray. He was co-leader of the Scottish forces with Wallace. They were both named Guardians of Scotland together, and after Moray's death, Wallace lost every significant battle afterward. This brings us to September 11th, 1297 and the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Yeah, it took place on a bridge. And it's believed that Moray was the one who came up with the battle plan of allowing part of the English army to march halfway across the bridge before attacking them. The battle was a huge win for the Scots. It sent the English army scurrying back to England and unfortunately Moray later died from the wounds he received during the battle. After the win at Stirling Bridge, Wallace was knighted and and invaded northern England, but much of the peasantry had fled at the Scots' approach, and without Moray as a strategist, Wallace failed to capture any fortified cities or castles other than a small castle. They did supposedly burn over 700 villages, though. When Edward led an army into Scotland to handle the rebellion, Wallace intentionally kept from facing him in battle, preferring to allow enough time for the English provisions to run out and the army to return to England. But yeah, this didn't happen, and instead, Edward learned of the Scots camping near Falkirk, so he went there and what followed on July 22nd, 1298, was a disastrous defeat for the Scots at the Battle of Falkirk. Oh, and the Scottish cavalry did flee the battle, but not because they were bought off, but rather because the English longbowmen were causing massive damage and they were completely outnumbered and outmatched by the English cavalry, so they chose to flee rather than be annihilated. After the loss, Wallace's reputation as a military leader was was greatly hurt, and not long after, he resigned as Guardian of Scotland. It's believed that Wallace spent the next several years in France trying to drum up support for his cause, and he was back in Scotland by 1304. And on August 5th, 1305, Wallace was betrayed and captured, not by Robert the Bruce, but by John Dementieth. Wallace was then sent to London, where he was found guilty of treason and sentenced to the typical punishment for treason, being hanged, drawn, and quartered. Yeah, we've already covered that in a previous video. So on August 23rd, 1305, Wallace was stripped naked, tied by the feet to the back of a horse and dragged through the streets before being hanged, then drawn, and while still alive, was castrated, disemboweled. These were burned in front of him, by the way. Then finally beheaded and quartered. His head was dipped in tar and placed on a pike on London Bridge as a warning. His other limbs were sent to and displayed in Newcastle, Berwick, Stirling, and Perth. And that was the end of William Wallace. Oh, and one thing we do 
do know is that he never took York. That was completely made up for the film Braveheart. And as you could probably tell by now, a lot about his life was made up for the movie Braveheart. Like and subscribe.